Okay, so <clears throat> we have been uh, talking about parametric curves, right? So just to review certain uh, points about parametric curves, what we have uh, found that parametric curves actually offer a rich variety of free form curves. By free form, we basically mean that uh, just the way we would like them to take a form which is not constrained by let us say its representation and just I would like to let us say draw a curve right which is which I can freely change that flexibility is basically offered by these parametric curves. So, uh, they are actually modeled as uh, piecewise polynomials and we uh, have <coughs> two aspects one is that they could be uh, interpolating curves that is what we uh, observed in the case of cubic splines the interpolating cubic splines or they could be approximation to a certain shape which is defined by certain input. So, that is what we are also going to look at. So, the idea is that you give an approximation of the shape you want to obtain as a design and the curve which is drawn approximates that right. So, there is no exact uh, notion of a particular shape, but you have an approximation or the idea of the shape you want to have. So, the splines which we uh, looked at basically are the splines which are interpolating splines. So, the word spline which we uh, observed was basically coming from a real life problem where the idea was to build these ships and uh, big beams were laid out to get a certain shape which was desired for the ship design and those were called as splines. So, similar idea has been uh, borrowed from there to construct these curves. So, we looked at these cubic splines where we had the two endpoints right like p 1 and p 2 and their tangent vectors which are basically the derivatives at that point p 1 and p 2 prime the derivative at the other end point p 2 right. So, given these conditions as inputs also the running parameter t 1 and t 2 we construct a, a spline which passes through these points and satisfy the tangent vector conditions at the two end points. That is what we obtain cubic splines for. Okay, so, now uh, if we extend the idea between the two points to any n number of points right. So, there we are concerned of having these tangent vectors determined by certain constraint which is imposed on the curve rather than this being satisfied this being uh, specified by the user right. So, again we would like that only the two n tangent vectors are specified if desired and the intermediate tangent vectors are determined or computed using some continuity condition right and what we used was that the C 2 C 2 continuity condition in the case of a cubic spline where we say that the second derivative is the same at the joining point. So, at this point we say that the second derivative for the first curve and the second derivative for the second curve at this point is equal 
and from there we derive the tangent vector right and this then can be extended to any set of points right so basically this sets up a system of equation and we solve for all the intermediate tangent vectors right so if we uh, just look at what is the input to the specification of cubic splines and how can we change let us say the spline in terms of its shape, what are the parameters right. So, we observe that the input which is required is a position vector and the tangent vectors right and there is this parameter T k which needs to be supplied right. So, for instance the uh, value of T k can be chosen either considering a uniform parameterization that is when I just say that each segment is basically has got the parameterization between 0 and 1 and, and that is what we also call as the normalized splines right. But we can also consider this parameterization being computed using chord length. What do we mean by chord length? It is basically the distance between the two data points which we are interpolating, right. It is a Euclidean distance between the two successive or the pair of points which we want to interpolate. So, we just take this distance measure and define that as the parameter T k, right. So, it is if you look at the from the point of view of parameterization, this is more natural a way of defining a parameterization because you are considering the data spread over the space, right. See parameterization in turn, in turn is capturing how you, you are going along the curve. So, the chord length parameterization is, is in some sense making this measure of the distance which you are going along the curve, right. So, this is uh, of more let us say relevance when we talk about certain uh, aspects of animation. And uh, again when I say that the input of position vectors and tangent vectors does influence the kind of spline you are going to construct right. For instance the magnitude of tangent vector can also influence the, the shape of the curve okay. Let me uh, give you a sort of a simple example. So, let us say if I have uh, a point P 1 here and a point P 2 here, right. So just consider a spline between two points, right. I specify the tangent vectors as P 1 prime, P 2 prime, right. So, considering that they are in some sense representative of the magnitude of these tangent vectors which I have drawn here, you will get a curve of the kind like this, right. Now, let us say I increase the magnitude of these tangent vectors. So, let us say it goes there. goes there okay what will happen is that this will this curve would actually lax so you will have a curve like this okay remember what we have spline as basically a consequence of blending of the geometric information coming from the position vector and the tangent vectors. 
So, the magnitude <laughs> is going to influence. So, you have one point, right? So, the tangent is at that point, right? And uh, the tangent gives only the direction. No, there is also a magnitude, remember? There is a magnitude, but how does it affect it? So, if you, if you go back, see what do you have? There is a matrix here, right? And there is this P1, P2, P1 prime, P2 prime. These are not, not just the directions, there is a magnitude involved in it and that is what going to scale the curve in some sense. See you are going to blend this with this, so this does affect. Right? Okay, given two points and the tangent vectors at those points, we can also draw a circle passing through those two points and uh, with those tangents because we know the angles of the tangents. Right. Those are the angles between, if there is a center, those are the angles between the radius. Right. So, we can always construct a circle passing through those two points yeah. with tangents as those tangent, right. uh, whereas a circle is a parametric equation in 2 degree. Yeah, so see the, 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 the circle, it is not, it's not the same way of parameterizing it. The circle has a parametric representation in terms of the angle you give. If I want to construct a circle using cubic spline, I, I just cannot, not, not this way. Okay. This would not satisfy all the conditions of a circle. This may look like a closed curve, but this may not have all the conditions what circle needs to satisfy. Okay. So, so what is being shown here is that when you change, see it will still satisfy the direction part of this tangent at the two points, but as I change the magnitude, the curve seems, seems to lax, that means it becomes sort of a a loose curve, right? It is not a tight curve, right? And in fact, it can go to the extent that if I increase like this, right? This actually may go like this, there is a loop, right? This is, however, not affecting its continuity. The curve's continuity is not getting affected, right? Right. So this is. So in fact, just specifying the tangent vector, right, is not let us say sufficient to have the same curve, you have to fix the magnitude okay, in this representation of cubic spline, right. So, what I basically am trying to demonstrate is that there are effect of the input you give in terms of its tangent vector, right. So, Okay. So, we also observed that the end conditions which are specified also affect the shape of the curve, right. It is also a control in terms of the kind of spline you would like to obtain. So, for instance, we observed these are the four commonly used end conditions, right. So, if the two end tangent vectors are specified, we say that these are clamped end conditions, 
and that is what we have basically uh, studied so far. If we have the second derivative term at the two ends to be 0, right, then we have what we call as relaxed or natural end conditions. So, remember that this is going to change the, the first and the last row of the matrix from where you would actually obtain the respective derivatives. Right. And we also had seen the cyclic end conditions where we would like to have the two end tangent vectors and their second derivatives at the end to match. Right. So, this is particularly of relevance when we want to construct closed curves. And there is also a possibility that you have this condition as anti cyclic, right? And we saw the example of something like a racket shape, right? So, these are sort of let us say control handles by which you can change or control the shape of the spline you are constructing, right? And they are always interpolating splines, they are interpolating the data points. Right. Now, let us go uh, to a different let us say type of uh, parametric curves, the, the different aspect which you want to uh, see is where we would like that the user or the designer specifies a general shape through certain input for what he or she wants to obtain as the shape of the curve. Okay. So, the user may be interested in specifying certain points. Right. He may not be interested that the curve needs to pass these through po three, these points, whereas the curve needs to have certain control from this input or the shape has to be governed by that input. Okay. So, the one of such kinds of curves are the Bezier curves and in fact, it was due to a person called Pierre Bezier in France who was basically working in Renault automobiles and his interest was for CAD CAM design to be able to have these free form curves which are easy to specify as, long, as, as far as the input is concerned. So, that is why the name Bezier is due to him. So, what do we have here? We have the input given as let us say points B0, B1, B2, B3 and this is the input given. Right? And the, the intention is that we would like to obtain a curve which is in some sense the capturing the shape specified by these points. Right? So, there is this curve which is obtained because of the influence of these points. Okay? So, again uh, mathematically when you want to see it, it is the points which are specified, the input points and some blending functions right which are used for taking the combination of these points right so these uh, polynomials or the blending functions in this case are the bernstein basis or blending functions okay and the points which are specified here are called as the control points right and if i try to build sort of a polygon through the sequence of points i get a bezier polygon or a control polygon okay so the name control is given because i am controlling in some sense the shape of the curve which is going to be generated Right. Okay. So, 
So here again you have this parametric definition coming through a parameter defined between a range 0 and 1. Okay. So now let us see a little more about these Bernstein polynomials which are the blending functions in this case. So this is how the Bernstein polynomials look like. Right. So this is N C i, right. You are probably familiar with that notation. Okay. Which is this n factorial divided by i factorial n minus i factorial. Okay. So now if we uh, look at these polynomial, if I want to evaluate, let's say at 0 and 0, so it says n is equal to 0, i is equal to 0, I have this equal to 1, okay. right. And also for all i other than between 0, 0 and n, I have this equals to 0, right. So this gives me the definition span of the polynomial and I also observe that it sums to 1, right. Summation j and i t for i is equal to 0 to n sums to 1, right. So this is also a property which is called as partition of unity or unity partition. Okay. And I also observe that each of these j and i t is non-negative for the values for t between 0 and 1. Okay. So some of these are of relevance which we will see it later. Okay. So now if you take the example of cubic. Right, where the degree of the Bernstein polynomial which I am considering is 3. Right. Then this is how the curve look like. Right. So this is j 3 0, j 3 1, j 3 2, j 3 3. Okay. These are just the plots of these. Right. And when I define my parametric curve, which is the Bezier curve in this case, would look like this, right. Basically, combinations of these polynomials with the Bezier control points, right. So, this is how it looks like, okay. So, Again, I can write it in a form which I had, I am familiar with, which we did for the case in cubic spline, where I take all these terms separate from the control points or the geometric information, which is in this case control points, right. And so then I can see a, a matrix which I can separate it again in the monomial form. So this is the monomial form of the coefficients 1, t, t square and t cube, right. So I get a matrix representation for cubic Bezier curve, right. Now these are the examples. So you have B0, B1, B2, B3. And this is the corresponding Bezier curve. In this case, this is B0, B1, B2, B3, and the curve is like this. So, by the way, these are not exactly computed Bezier curves for these control polygons. Okay, this I have just sketched. So, there, these are definitely not the exact curves, there is a possibility of error. 
Okay. So, these are not the computed curves. So, so again, so all you observe here is that these control points are in some sense giving the idea of the shape of the curve and that is what we were trying to achieve. Right? And from the user's perspective, it becomes easier just to specify the location of these points and obtain the resulting curve. Okay. So, again this is a little bigger uh, curve and the other thing which we notice is that there is a direct correlation between the number of control points of the Bezier polygon to the degree of the Bezier curve which I am designing. Right? Here this was a cubic curve, right? the number of control points I had was and the degree of the curve is 3. Right? So, similarly I have here 11 control points between 0 and 10 going from 0 and 10. So, the degree of the curve is 10. Right? So, the degree and the number of control points are directly related. Okay. So, now let us try to see certain properties of these Bezier curves. So, the first thing which we observe just by the plots of various curves which we have seen that the Bezier curve interpolates to the end points, the first control point and the last control point, it passes through. Right? So, that can easily be seen here. If I just substitute for t equals to 0, what happens to the j and i? Right? I see that it becomes 1 and the rest becomes 0. Right? So, it immediately gives us p at 0 as this. right? all the other terms are cancelled and I get this x b 0. Right? It is just a simple substitution. Fine. Similarly, at t is equal to 1, if I substitute for the evaluation of j and n, I observe that uh, for i is equal to n, this turns out to be 1 and for the rest turns out to be 0. So, again at p is equal to 1, all I get is this, right, which is b n, the last Bezier point. Next, the next uh, property which we are going to look at is the affine invariance. So, what do I mean by affine invariance? It basically says that if I apply an affine transformation to the curve, right, it is actually equivalent to applying the transformation to the control points. Right. So, basically, what I mean here is that uh, if this is the basic curve obtained by these control points, b0, b1, b2, b3 and I apply some affine transformation to this. right? So, the curve would have gone there. right? Now, instead if I had applied the fine transformation only to the control points, which would have given me the control points as b0, b1, b2, b3 here, then the curve computed from them would have been the same. So, that is a useful property right? because if you want to apply a fine transformation to the curve, you rather apply to the control points. Right? Is it fine? So, how can we sort of uh, 
see it more mathematically. So, let us say if I consider an affine map which I define it as phi to some x, right. It basically means that I have some matrix A, a 3 by 3 matrix in 3 space or 2 by 2 matrix in 2D and there is this translation term here some V, right. So, now this x in our case which is the curve right P t is nothing but it looks like this. There are these Bezier points, Bezier control points and there are some some coefficients coming from the Bernstein polynomials, right. So, now when I apply this to this, it basically means this on the right side, all I need to do is just substitute for x this, right and I just uh, rewrite this where I take this A inside, right, just, just as a linear operator. And knowing that in our case, the summation to the coefficients is equal to 1, right. We saw that the summation of Bernstein polynomials is actually 1. So, I just use that, multiply this by unity, which means summation of alpha is to V, right, and just rearrange the terms in this way which gives me this, which is to say that this is an affine map of V i's or affine transformation of V i's, right. So, I can also see the same thing mathematically, fine. The other uh, property which is also of a uh, great relevance is that the curve lies in the convex hull of the control points. So, if I have this basic curve here defined as P t coming from the control points B 0, B 1, B 2, B 3, then this curve is going to reside inside the convex hull made by these points B 0, B 1, B 2, B 3. Okay. So, which means that first of all let us try to construct the convex hull of the control points which will look like this, right. This is the convex hull. All it says that the curve is going to lie within this, right. And now we will use the, the properties of our Bernstein polynomials, right. If I have to have a point or a curve within the convex hull of these control points would actually mean that the point which is computed uses the convex combination of those points, those set of points or the control points, right. And how do I get these convex combinations? By these two properties, right. Remember that these are non negative each of them and then they sum to 1 ok. So, this gives me the convex hull property which is again a nice property where, where, where do you think you can use this property. any any application of this property okay so i i give you an example here so let's say you have uh, this curve or anything designed using these curves right so if you want to uh, determine an intersection or you are trying to determine whether the 
the object which is constructed using these curves collides with an, any other object. So, what, what, what can you do there? You can basically perform the intersection with respect to the convex hull first right? and only when the convex hull intersects, you need to find the intersection with the curve. Right? So, it is a pruning. So, you can prune out the intersection by performing the intersection with convex hull, right. So, that is the that is the advantage you get. Okay. So, there is another uh, property which is kind of obvious is that it is symmetric with respect to t and 1 minus t. Meaning that if I have P t defined by the Bezier points B 0, B 1, B n is equal to the curve P 1 minus t defined by B n, B n minus 1, B 0. Right? Which is actually from here only. Right? So, this is saying that this curve is the same as this curve, right? And that is easy to establish, right? Okay. The other uh, property is that let us say yeah, so far what we have done is we have basically looked at the curves which are defined through the parameter t in an interval 0 and 1, right. But there could be instances or situations where this parameter definition is not between 0 and 1. So, the question is does it matter? Right. So, all, all we are saying is that in that case I need a transformation. Right. So, this t was basically defined between 0 and 1, there is another parameter u which is defined between a and b. So, I just need to map this and I can do that using some affine transformation using just the ratios. and substitute for this then here, right. So, practically it does not really matter even if I have the parameter defined in a different span than 0 and 1. I can always map that to the parameter between 0 and 1, okay. Now, there is an another uh, sort of property is something like a pseudo local control. See when you look at these Bernstein polynomials, here they are for the cubic case, what we observe is that this j and i t, each one of them has a maximum given at t is equal to i over n. So, for instance, for this you have the maximum here, right. For this you have a maximum somewhere there, for this you have a maximum somewhere there. So, it is 2 by 3 i over n and it is somewhere here, right. So, basically it means that if I move a particular control point of the Bezier polygon, right. What is the kind of influence I have to the curve, right. So, in some sense it is telling you that if I move let us say the 
the uh, laser point B2, the maximum influence is going to be there around this parameter T is equal to 2 by 3, right. So, in some sense it is telling you a kind of a local control with respect to each of the control points I have, right. Just by the definition of the Bayesian curve, we observe that moving any point, moving any point of the Bayesian polygon is going to change the entire curve. Right, but there is some sort of a local influence of a particular control point, which in some sense tells you that there is a local control, although there is a change of the entire curve. Right, so in fact, this aspect of let us say global control or non-local control of basic curve is sometimes considered as a limitation to the design of parametric curves, because every time you change a curve, the entire curve changes. Right? Okay, so, here uh, sort of an example is given. So, if this point is moved right, to this point, Right. So, the curve which was initially this changes to this right and you see that the curve the entire curve is changing, but there is a larger change to the neighborhood of the parameter influenced by this point which is i over n. Okay. So, this is important to know from the point of view of designing curves. So, as a user you should know that when I am going to change a particular point, what is the range of the influence to the curve, right. So, this is useful from the interface. Okay. Now, another uh, property which is variation diminishing. So, what it says is that no straight line, this is in the case of planar curves. So, when I talk about space curve, they become the plane, right. So, here it says for planar curves, no straight line intersects a Bayesian curve more number of times than it intersects the curves control polyline, right. So, in this case, these are the, the legs of the polylines of the Bayesian control point or control polygon and this is the curve. So, when I look at the intersection with respect to this line, I observe that it inter intersects at three points and so does the curve, right. But this is the maximum number of times it can intersect with the curve, which in turn says that the kind of twist and turns offered by the various segments of the control polygon right is a sort of a maximum the curve may follow it but it will be less than that right so the variations are diminishes diminished right and again if you go back and look at the convex hull property, right. So, if I have the Bayesian control polygon convex, right, maximum it is going to intersect two times, right, a line can intersect two times and that is what I will have with the curve maximum. So, it sort of asserts the convexity. right. So, this is for a bigger example. So, here I have a curve with 23 control points. So, it is of a degree 22. 
So, at any point for instance if I consider the yellow line it intersects 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 times right whereas to the curve it intersects 1, 2 and 3 times. right ok. So, uh, now we come to the, the tangent vectors and the derivatives which actually give us the tangent vectors for the curve. So, if I am interested in finding out the derivative of the curve which is just meaning that I differentiate with respect to the parameter t in turn means that I need to do a differentiation of these j and i's right. So, now let us just examine the differentiation of these j and i's. So, if I differentiate this which is basically this I get something like this right i t to the power i minus 1 1 minus t n minus i and the second term is this right which I can again rearrange and write in this form right and eventually I get something like n times g n minus 1 i minus 1 minus g n minus 1 So, now when I uh, see the derivative of the curve itself, I use that which is this multiplied to the major points b i's right and again I do some rearrangement of the terms and eventually I get this which is n times summation i 0 to n minus 1 p i plus 1 minus b i j n minus 1 i right. So, all I am doing is some kind of a first difference of b i's right. Now, if I try to evaluate these at the two end points I observe this right which is n times b 1 minus p 0 and at the other end it is n times b n minus 1 b n minus 1 which is saying that the tangent vectors at the ends of the curve have the same direction as the first and the last polygon spans. Right, just from there. Okay, so now you can sort of do a correlation of the cubic splines as well. See, I can sort of map these two if I want to. Right here, there I was specifying the two end tangent vectors and the points. Right, so here if I had given the four control points I am basically doing a similar thing it is an equivalence in some sense. Yeah in this case see I, I am basically computing through this n right. So, if I if I have a cubic right. So, this is 3 times the first leg and is again 3 times the last leg ok. So, now again let us say I take the case of a cubic spline uh, cubic Bezier curve right where uh, this is my Bezier polygon and I just basically write the first differences as these legs of the poly polygon 
right. So, this is delta B 0, this is delta B 1 and this is delta B 2. And now, remember that if I go back here, this is my derivative for the curve, which is again taking the first difference and having this Bernstein polynomial of degree n minus 1, right. Now, if you look at this, what do you say about the result? What does this say, this whole thing? What is Bezier curve? This is another Bezier curve. This is nothing but another Bezier curve obtained by this difference. Okay, so this is exactly what I have tried to demonstrate here. So if I construct, the only thing is these, since they are the first differences of the points. So, they are not defined in the Euclidean space, they are just vectors. So, I need to define some origin somewhere, right, which I let us say fix it somewhere here and just plot the, the differences, first differences here as vectors. Okay. So, this gives me a point here, this gives me another point here and this gives me another point here. These are the three Bezier points, right? And if I plot now the Bezier curve obtained by these three points, that's what my tangent vectors are. Right? So the first derivative of the Bezier curve is actually a Bezier curve. Interesting, no? Okay. Now, we uh, move on to another type of construction of Bezier curves. Okay, so, so far what we have seen is basically a basis or blending functions used as the Bernstein polynomials for obtaining the Bezier curves. Now, let us say I have a case of a quadratic Bezier curve, which needs for me to define three Bezier points B0, B1 and B2. Right? Now, what do I do? And I have this parametric domain defined through t between 0 and 1. Now, what do I do for a given t, where I want to evaluate or construct a point on the Bezier curve? I do a linear interpolation for the legs of the polygon. So, I locate this point P10 as a linear interpolation of B0 and B1 through the parameter t, right, which locates the point here. Right. Similarly, for the other span, I do a linear interpolation between B1 and B2, which locates the point B11. Right. And then, I do the same linear interpolation through the parameter t for the leg b10 and b11 okay so basically i do a linear interpolation between these two points and obtain the point b20 okay so b20 is a linear interpolation of this this was, if you recall, was a linear interpolation of this leg and this was a linear interpolation along this leg. And if I just open this up, this is what I get. And what are these? 
these are the Bernstein polynomials of degree 2. So, what do I get? Bezier curve. So, this B 2 0 point which I obtained after the second interpolation is actually a point on the curve. So, this construction is due to a person called D Castillo who gave this algorithm of constructing parametric curves which were later on called as Bezier curves because Bezier came only in 1970s whereas D Castillo came in early 1900s. So, he had already done this. Okay, so, same construction using Bernstein polynomial actually can be obtained by repetitive linear interpolations. Okay. So, let us stop here, I will continue on this de Castle algorithm and again try to see those properties which we have studied using Bernstein polynomials, how do they, how do they get, they get mapped. Right? Thank you.